Take your Bible, if you would, uh, and turn with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter. Uh, We've been in a series where, uh, as I mentioned, if you were here last week, where we we took uh, several weeks before Easter, we'd ask you to to think about some things you were struggling with, some things that you wanted to nail to to the cross. And we did that physically in this room. We took those, we categorized those, and then we've created this series based on what you wrote down that you wanted to nail uh, to the cross. I want to remind you of, uh, of the passage that really inspired uh, what we did that Sunday. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, the second part of it in 14. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. When Christ nailed our sins, nailed the record of our sins to the cross. He helped us to overcome those. But it's not just our sins that he can help us overcome. There's other struggles and other issues in life that God can help us with. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about how God can help us, how the Savior can help us to nail our worry, our anxiety to the cross, how we can find victory today, find joy in the midst of the struggle. And I would just give as a little disclaimer today. Uh, What we talk about today from Scripture, with the Lord's help, um, my prayer is that, that there'll be people to be set free, that you'll be encouraged today. I also want to recognize that there'll be some of you that, that, that what's going on in your life, the struggle with worry and anxiety, uh, you need someone to come alongside you. I, alongside you. And I would just encourage you that if you need some professional, uh, a professional counselor to, to take those steps, that that's something that God can use in a wonderful way to help you to find the victory that you need. And so that can be part of the equation for you. So don't, don't discount how God could use someone else in your life to uh, a trained professional that might be able to come alongside. So we do, as we often mention, have a relationship with Southwest Medical, uh, the counseling arm Uh, And so if you tell them you're a part of First Church, you can get every year a couple of counseling sessions for free through them. So uh, just FYI, just would would throw that out. If you need that uh, extra help, uh, God can use that in a wonderful way. I remember when Chris and I, we were youth pastors, and we uh, had been on a young adult retreat, and we're coming back. It was a Sunday, and I had to lead youth that night. And uh, Crystal at that time was pregnant with Jacob, our second son. Uh, Caleb was just a toddler, and he was kind of done. He was kind of through, and so you know how that is if you've got kids. And so uh, I dropped her off at home so she could put Caleb down for a nap. Well, I went to Walmart to get some of the supplies I needed, important ministry supplies for the evening of youth ministry. I was uh, filling my shopping cart with shaving cream and water balloons and copious amounts of chips and high fructose corn syrup lace drinks. And as I was finishing up my rounds through Walmart, I heard over the intercom what sounded like my name. They would, you know, Kay, come to the service center. And I thought I heard my name, but I just discounted that because why would somebody say something to me? And so I'm, you know, finishing up my shopping. And then I hear hear it again. Like, well, this is the days before you carried a cell phone everywhere. Some of you remember those days. Others of you have never known a day when you didn't carry a cell phone everywhere. But this was one of those days. And so I finally go to the, the counter up front. I said, well, I'm, did you call for David Culp? I'm David Culp. And they said, yes, your wife's on the phone. Okay, that's odd. And so Crystal, on the other end of the phone, was frantic. She said, you need to come home. Something's wrong. I think I'm having a miscarriage. And so that moment, that nightmarish day, began for us a series of appointments and doctor visits and ultrasounds getting that devastating news that they thought that there was something wrong with Jacob's heartbeat. And so the question I would ask for us today is how on those days can we possibly do what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, when Paul says to us, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Always Really, Paul, always, always rejoice, always find joy. If you, if you skip down, he, he says that, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. If you skip down to verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, 
What does this Paul guy know about struggle? What, is, what, would, what could he possibly know about pain, about finding joy, about overcoming worry? I mean, this sounds like one of those guys that was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. It's one of those individuals whose life is characterized by one lucky break, one lucky turn of events after another. But oh yeah, this is Paul. This is Paul, the guy that did know something about hardship and struggle and betrayal and pain. Paul, who was writing these very words from a prison cell, a cell that, uh, you know, a place at the hands of the Romans, he would, he would ultimately die for his faith. There was one time that he, he gave us a little list of, of his pedigree to talk to us on the subject of worry and anxiety and struggle and pain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the second part of it, he talks about his life and describes some of the things that he's gone, to, gone through. More imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Sounds like a guy I don't want to travel with, <laughs> by the way. Um, but this is a guy that understood. This is a guy that had been through it. They can say with experience. And, and, and when, when he says something like, rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about anything. It's a guy we ought to maybe pay attention to. Maybe he has something to teach us, something to help us with. As we put into practice some of the things that he talks about. That maybe we can find help as we battle worry and anxiety, something that at times plagues us all. In those days when we end up in that cataclysmic struggle, trying to find joy in the midst of our struggle as we are living in the house of worry. One of the things that's helpful up front is to maybe define terms. And so what does biblical joy, what, what, when he talks about rejoicing in the Lord always, and, 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 and by the way, in this fourth chapter, uh, he talks about it over and over. So how, do, how is he defining it? Thomas Newberry helps us when he wrote, joy is an outward sign of inward faith in the promises of God. Another definition, definition that Ada Bible uh, Church pastor Jeff Mannion, some of you are familiar with Pastor Mannion, he wrote this, joy is the focus on the generosity of God that expresses itself through gratitude and praise even in seasons of extreme pain and deep disappointments. Joy, even in seasons of extreme pain and deep disappointment. I'm reminded of something, that, a story that Pastor Chris shared a few years ago. He and Candy, after living in their home for 25 years, had sold it, moved into a new place. Uh, he tells the story of jumping into his car. A lot was going on. He had a lot, uh, a lot, of, a lot of struggles at that particular time uh, that he was uh, going through. And as he's driving along, his mind is racing through all the things, all the worry and anxiety, and all the all the things. And he he pulls into his driveway, and he's as he's you know his mind's preoccupied with all this going on. He notices. I wonder who these cars are at my house. I don't recognize these cars. And then he, and then he realized, this is not my house anymore. I, I pulled into my old house. This is not my actual house any longer. He didn't intend to drive there. He just ended up there at his old house because he's following the old habits. He's just kind of in that rut. And I think for us, it's easy for us to end up just by those ruts that the world carves out for us. It's easy for us to end up at the house of worry. Even though that's not our home anymore, it doesn't have to be our house anymore, it doesn't have to be our residence anymore, it's easy for us if we're not paying attention to just end up at the house of worry. So how can we, as we look at what Paul has to share with us and help us with, how can we find victory? How can we find help and find joy in the midst of our worry and anxiety? How can we choose joy as Scripture says? So that's a, the first thing. Just want to encourage us today to, as we're thinking, to choose joy over instead of worry and anxiety. Go back. Look at verse 4 again. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. 
Paul, in this letter to the church at Philippi, over and over and over again, he talks to them about joy. 16 different times in the fourth chapter alone, he talks about joy. Joy, not just random joy, but what does he say? Rejoice how in the Lord. He's intentional with his words. This is the game changer and how we find this kind of joy. It's in the Lord. In the Lord, both in this life, it can make a difference, and for eternity, it makes a difference. In the Lord, being in the Lord. That we, when we are in the Lord, we can find joy as a follower of Christ. That we can choose Instead of just going through the motions of, of life and just ending up again at the house of worry that we can, we can work with the Lord's help. As we are in Christ, we can find, even in the midst of the struggle, we can, with his help, find joy. And we do that when we internalize that reality that we are in Christ. We internalize God's goodness. There's a lot of things that we have in life that we can be thankful for. We can be thankful for the roof of our head. We can be thankful for the food on our table. We can be thankful for the gas in the tank. We can be thankful for those things. And yeah, that's maybe a small piece, but really what he's talking about is the difference knowing Christ makes. Knowing Christ in the midst of the other stuff. It's not the stuff that we can find joy in that or we can find joy despite what's going on because they had a bunch of stuff. Because in reality, there are people in our world that don't have a roof over their head right now, that don't know where the next meal is coming from, that don't have gas in the tank, and yet they, with Christ's help, experiencing the goodness of God, they can say that they have found joy even in those struggles. Deep joy can be found despite the struggles of this world. As we consider who we are in Christ, when we consider our Savior that gave his life for us as a substitute for us on the cross. Deep joy filled by, filled by, the, filled by the goodness of God that no matter how bad life gets in this world, that, that this is not our home. This is, this, this is a temporary place. We're, we're just sojourners. We're just on our way. We're passing through this world to the world that will last forever. Deep joy knowing the one who spoke this world into existence loves us is on our side, is our Heavenly Father. As we walk through those deep valleys that are a natural part of this life, that, that we have an anchor, that we have a foundation that, that keeps our perspective correct amidst, in the midst of all the baggage of the world. I want to give you an assignment this week. And that assignment would be to just make a list, just to experience some gratitude, to have a gratitude moment as you just experience and think about all the things that you have to be thankful for all the blessings, all the things that you could be grateful for. And not just the, the things, but the, the people, the relationships, the, the, the spiritual things, the, the intangible things, the future that you have if you are in Christ. We have so much to be thankful for. And as we choose joy over worry, we start by remembering the goodness of God. We start with gratitude. There's a little bonus thought that I want to throw into the mix as we think about all this today. And I don't think that what Paul is talking about here when he talks about worry, he talks about anxiety, that he's talking about just the, the natural thing that just comes up. That we really, as, a, as just being human, that there are things that we care about, that we're concerned about, that, that we that have that mild level of worry or anxiety about. In fact, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, the, the similar Greek word he uses, and he says, he talks about the pressure and the anxiety that he feels for the churches. So we can't be talking about that, that any time ever that you, you have any concern, any worry, any anxiety, that that's somehow wrong. But I think what he's talking about is when it turns toxic. As we think about, is this bonus little bonus point? We don't let worry or anxiety turn toxic. Because we have, all of us have times that we, you know, we're, we're, we, we have concern for the kids and the grades and the, the news from the doctor and the finances and a thousand other things. So that's just a natural part of life that helps us to, to, to think through what, maybe what we need to do and the approach to that, whatever that issue is, that we have that, that appropriate level of worry or anxiety. Toxic worry, on the other hand, is excessive and persistent. 
Toxic worry is irrational. Toxic worry is, is bringing, a $5, bringing $5 worth of worry to a 50-cent problem. William Ward helps define that toxic variety when he says this, it's wasting today's time cluttering up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's trouble. And there's a fine line between these worlds, but with God's help, we can find we can find a way to navigate the, the line between the worry, the anxiety that's just natural, and that when it becomes toxic. So go back to verse 5. Let your reasonableness, your gentleness, in other words, be known to everyone the Lord is at hand. I think Paul knew human nature. He knew that we have a tendency when we are worried and we are preoccupied that we have a tendency to pull people into that pain. That we struggle to be reasonable. We struggle to have a gentle spirit when we're worried and anxious. What's the old ad adage when mama's not happy, nobody's happy? And that is really only half right. Because when any of us are unhappy, no one is happy typically around us. Because we do impact the people around us. He goes on in verse 6 and he says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So instead of worry, instead of anxiety, instead of that, that debilitating, toxic variety, what does he say? He says, take it to the Lord. If we think of worry versus anxiety, anxiety is that broader term, broader than worry that refers to more of that intense pervasive, that, that sense of, of fear, that sense of apprehension that even a lot of times is associated with physical symptoms. I'm anxious and that toxic anxiety that, that causes my heart to race, causes me to sweat, causes me to, to tremble, shortness of breath, anxiety when toxic interferes in my relationship, interferes with my life, interferes with my interaction with the people, interferes with my quality of life. And what Paul is telling us, don't be anxious like that. Don't, don't let that, that, that toxic anxiety destroy your life. Instead, look to the Lord for help. Pray. Allow him to bring victory over the anxiety. So choose joy over worry and anxiety. Seek the Lord's help. Paul, when he, or uh, Jesus, when he was, 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 when his disciples asked for some help in prayer, he told them, Take it to the Lord. Ask for the Lord's help. And that's what Paul is saying here, to, to, to bring it back to him. So look back at those moments when we gotten that news about Jacob in the pregnancy. That news going back now almost two years ago when we got that news, first news that maybe that Jacob had been diagnosed with cancer. Those first moments. What do you do? Do you just stew in that or do you take it to the Lord in prayer? And we took it to the Lord in prayer on those occasions and then invited you. And it's, it's what's the wonderful thing about the body of Christ that we can pray for one another and we can support one another. We can be there for one another. And prayer is that, that thing that can help us, that we can ask for God's help and we can seek after him. We can find that support. There's power knowing there's help uh, knowing that the God who moves mountains, that, that, that spoke this world into existence, is the God who loves us and is on our side. And we can give our pain and we can give our struggle to him in the midst of not understanding how it's going to work out and not understanding what the future hold, holds, that I can find comfort. I can even find joy knowing that my God walks with me and I can trust him. There's a power when I seek his help. Look at those next few verses in verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So just think about that list again. What, what, what does Paul tell us? What's true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and anything worthy of praise? Think on these things. Focus on these things. How many people have your to-do list? You love to-do list. You make a to-do list just so you can check off the to-do list. And maybe you even make a to-do list that says make a to-do list just so you can check it off the to-do list. Anybody that loves to-do list? Okay, yeah. 
And then there's those of us who don't necessarily like the to-do list, and we think people that make the to-do list are crazy. Any of you people? Yeah, it's kind of a waste of time. Okay. Okay, there's both variety. What Paul is asking us to do, he says, make a to-think list. When worry and anxiety are debilitating, that our mind just races with all the possibilities and all the permeations of, of what could be and should be and maybe this and maybe that and what in the world and how am I going to fix that? When that comes, what does he say? When that list grows and, and our thinking goes dark and, 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 and all the things that we're thinking of that could go wrong, all the twist of every word, every detail, everything that someone says we take the wrong way, all the details, all the potential outcomes. If we just maybe could do what Paul encourages us to do and to, to go back to the to think list. And we force ourselves to, to think on some different things. I love what Mark Twain said. He said, I've been through some trouble. I, I, I've been, I have been through some terrible things in my life. I've been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. That's what Mark Twain said. Sorry, I messed that quote up a little bit. Let me say it again. Uh, I've been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. That's all of us. We worry so much about things. We worry and we're anxious about things at times that never happened. Many of us have asked Jesus into our heart, and some of us need to ask Jesus into our mind. To ask him into our mind. Think on these things, Paul says. Make a conscious effort to renew your mind, to guard your mind. You choose joy over worry and anxiety, guard your mind. Our world, our world we live in, a, in an age when we're overcome with anxiety and worry I think back, it was 1980, I was just getting out of uh, grade school when CNN, for the very first time, began broadcasting, 1980, 24-hour-a-day news. What a wonderful time. <laughs> so instead of just coming home at the end of the day and be able to read the paper and to see the negative news or to watch the nightly news, you know, the Dan Rathers and the whatever of, of that age, instead of that, just, you know, once a day kind of getting it, 24 hours a day. How many of us, as maybe you've even sat here, your, your, your watch has buzzed or your phone has buzzed in your pocket and you've wa looked at it and it's some bit of news, some negative something that's going on in the world. That's the world we live in. 24 hour a day, negative all the time. It's constant. And, and as we think about Paul and he's telling us to renew our mind what would it look like if we tried, to, tried to, to guard our minds? If we tried to focus, as he's saying, instead of just this 24-hour-a-day negativity, what if we guarded our mind, we set a guard, and we focused, and we made ourselves focus on things that were true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable, if we thought on these things, how that might help us? In this world that pushes us, these, again, these... These ruts that push us, make us have this propensity toward worry and worry and anxiety. What would it look like if we, if we focus on something different? And that's why this, this time that we have like this is so critical. That we come together and, and if you paid attention to the, some of the, the, to the songs that we're singing, and I wish Chad could have just found some songs that applied more directly to what we're talking about today. I leaned over to Chris and was like, these songs are exactly what we're talking about. And the ones that come next are exactly what we're talking about. And it just reminds us of how good our God is and that, that he is, is on our side and he's amazing and he will get us through. And that's why we need each other as we walk through the difficult valleys of life. That we can help each other. Worship can help us to get our minds off of just the negative, off of the worry, off of the anxiety, onto our God who is our help, who is our provider, who was our heavenly father. There's one more thing. As the, look at these final couple verses. He says, And the peace of God which passes, surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. And then verse 9, he talks about what you've learned and received and heard from me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. He's reminding them when you practice what I'm saying here, that you can have the peace of God, peace with God, the peace of God can be ours as we choose Joy over worry. Remember God's goodness. Seek his help. Prayer. 
Peace, it has been said, is the fruit of the believing believer's prayer. So prayer and seeking God's help, focusing on the good things, the God things, as we renew our minds, it has the power to bring us peace. My prayer is that we would be able to find peace today in the midst of the worry and the anxiety. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that, that, that we have a God that can be trusted. A God whose ways are higher than our, way, our ways. Even when we can't understand and we don't know what the future holds, that we can trust him. A God who breathed this world into existence that said he's on our side, that he's with us. A God who loves us, who loves this world. That peace can be found in him. In Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's my prayer for us today. And invite our worship team to come back up. As I come back up, I just want to go back to Pastor Chris's story. He got in his car. He put his mind in neutral, the ruts that he'd driven for 25 years, and he ends up at his old house. And in the same way, we can, if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, we can end up at an old house. A house that God wants to help us to navigate through, to help keep us out of the toxic variety of worry and anxiety that debilitates us. The world's pattern pushes us, pushes us into that place as we slip our mind into neutral and we end up, if we're not careful, into that same old house of worry. But today... Let's consciously decide to choose joy, to put into practice what Paul tells us, to rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord, to remember the goodness of God, to, to practice gratitude as we think about his goodness, to choose God, to request some help. Prayer can help us as we focus on him, to choose to renew my mind, to think on those things, to let Christ not just enter my heart, but to let him enter my mind. And as we think about those things, what Scripture tells us, what Paul tells us, is that we can experience peace with God, of God, in the midst of the struggle. So, Heavenly Father, as we conclude, as we sing these final songs, I pray, God, that you would use these words to remind us, remind us, God, that you're with us, that you're here. Help us, Father, to find freedom from the change that chains of worry and anxiety that bind us today. And we pray in Jesus' name.